Good evening, students. In December 2020, question number 3, we will be continuing on the uh, case study or the 50 marks question. The, there were two other videos on the 2020 December paper we uploaded. So, this is the third one we are recording now. So, basically the December 2020, as you know, there are three questions. So, there will be three videos. I think the first two videos would I cover the question 1, question 2 and question 3 in the pre-seen analysis uh, discussion and the few parts of the case questions I have done. So, two questions on the question number 3, two parts will be discussed today. Right, so that is uh, section B, section B, and section D. So we'll come to the D later. So we'll discuss now section B of the question. So if you go to the unseen material, matter one, matter one, they talk about the chairman introduced his mega project plan to develop a multi-purpose vaccine targeting. COVID-19 and seasonal influenzas by hiring skillful scientists under the LKISB of HCL. So basically, the company we were talking, HCL, under the LKISBU, they are having five SPU we discussed in the pre-scene. So out of five, there is one segment called healthcare. So under the healthcare, they are planning to start uh, or develop a multi-purpose vaccine targeting 2000, sorry, COVID-19 seasonal influenza, both uh, virus issues by adding skillful scientists under the healthcare. So the, health, uh, the strategy was to penetrate into the global market with an aff affordable price targeting low income countries in the medium and long term. The shareholders were assistant to go ahead with the proposal given the large amount of investment involved. However, the shareholder requests the CFO to carry out a financial evaluation with the given probabilities as this would be a major game changer or at least a good selling pitch for the planned share listing attempt. So, in the pre-scene, we were talking, the company was planning for uh, IPO, that is initial public offering. So, on the continuation of that, the chairman is coming up with a plan of getting into a mega project. So that's what we are talking now. And the R&D work will be carried out in three phases, followed by commercial production. So I think some of the things we discussed previously also, they are talking about a larger project, very large project, which will involve 15 years of operation and seven years of research. So research and testing process. And after that, then there will be a 15 years of operation. So the phases given, phase 1 duration 1 year, that is lab testing phase, then a phase 2 duration 2 years and phase 3 4 years. So altogether 7 years of lab testing, developing the vaccine for 2 segments and testing for continuous protection against the both viruses. So after 7 years, if everything is fine, they will be starting on the operation commercial production. So in terms of the cash flows, they are given you lab testing one year period, you would incur 1.25 billion which has to be incurred at the beginning of the project. So that means year zero you would incur the 1.25 and there is a 70 percent chance that the drug will successfully pass phase one. So that means there is a 30 percent chance the testing, lab testing will fail. So we have to understand that there is a possibility the outcomes could be either it is a success or a failure. Then developing the vaccine for two segments, they have uh, dividing the patients into two segments. One is without the health complications, people or the customers, and the patients with the health complications. So type one and type two, they have sixty percentage of chance that the drug will be developed for type one patients, and there is a forty percent chance that the drug will be developed for type two patients. So these all we are doing at the beginning of the whole project. The estimated cost of the entire phase, that is the second phase of two years, 2.5 billion, which, would be, which is to be paid at the beginning of year two. Beginning of year two means year one end, year one end. Earlier we said beginning of year one, that means year zero. 
Then a phase 3 that will take duration 4 year period. Testing for continuous protection against both virus type 1 and 2 will be tested separately. There is 75 percent chance that the drug will prove successful for type 1 patients and the estimated cost is 7.5 billion. There is 40 percent chance that the drug will prove successful for type 2 patients and the estimated cost is 6.25 billion. Assume that this cost will be incurred at the beginning of the phase 3, beginning of the year 3, beginning of phase 3 is when? End of third year, end of third year. Commercial production will commence at the end of seven years, end of seven year and the following are the initial setup cost and then at annual cash flow. So, that is the place or the point at which you are basically uh, come to stage where you can start commercial production that is end of seven years. At that point you have to incur one time cost of type 1 if it is 15 billion otherwise 12.5 billion and from there onwards you will see net annual cash flows after tax 10 billion for 15 years and 3.1 billion for 15 years that depends on type 1 and 2. NPV calculator using the cash flow adjusted for probabilities ending up positive NPV of 4 billion rupees. So, this project the B mega project they are saying NPV they will realize 4 billion NPV of rupees 4 billion they will uh, achieve 4 billion NPV. The company will raise capital for the mega project through a public share issue and debt capital obtained from banks. So, they are going to fund this project purely from share issue and debt from the banks. Assume the weighted added cost of capital of the existing business would remain unchanged. However, since the new project will be financed with an incremental level of debt, incremental WC would be 10 percent. So, the project the NPV is calculated at the rate of 10 percent. That is your WACC. Then financing of the mega project again, financing decision for such a massive risky project as this was a large question on everyone's mind, it was clear that the current shareholders would be reluctant on the project, but they did not turn it down as the chairman was quite positive about it. Some of the existing shareholders suggested that the project could be financed predominantly by debt capital and undertaken under a new company, however final decision was not made on this. So, basically this is about the financing part of it. So, there is a discussion on the 70 percent debt financing and the start as a new company not as SBU separate company to do this project. So, the question here we are talking about because we have tried out of the five pa four parts we have done already two parts. So, the third part we are trying is a B part. So, B part validate the accuracy of the 4 billion value creation as a result of a new mega project and comment whether there is an increase in share price necessarily due to this NPV, positive NPV. So, there are two parts in that question. One is validate this 4 billion. So, that means you have to recalculate and see whether you are getting 4 billion roughly. Second, comment whether there is an increase in share price necessarily due to this positive NPV. Now, what is the knowledge of our NPV on the share value creation. What is the knowledge we have? When you say a project gives you positive NPV, when you say a project gives positive NPV, positive NPV ideally, ideally your wealth of the company creates, your wealth is created. So, assume that your present, present wealth of the company say 15 billion say 15 billion and you say that new project, new project NPV is 4 billion. The question is asking, I am attempting the second part of the B part, where they are asking whether necessarily the 4 billion will get added to the value of the company or the wealth of the company. So, the theoretically you should know, theoretically you should know when you say NPV is positive, your wealth of your present company, present business will be added with this 4 billion NP, new project NP. This is a theoretical situation where when you say your project is positive, immediately, immediately, theoretically it should add up to the your present wealth. So, your wealth will come to 19 billion for example. So, if your wealth is 15 billion now, 4 billion should add up. Do not think how the 15 billion was taken, I just taken 15 billion 
on a rough number to tell uh, the explanation what I want to make here is the 4 billion new project in PV will add the wealth of your company shareholders and the wealth will go to 19 billion so that there is a positive impact. Only thing there are certain circumstances your 4 billion will not get added right so I think maybe I would have discussed sometime in the previous day also the 4 billion when you say you are adding to your NPV sometimes the project new NPV will not get added to your wealth immediately. One is information not shared information not shared if the public at large if you say your company listed and people in the market may not be knowing exactly how much your wealth is going to get created because of the project. Generally the people or the companies announce, announce to the public through the Columbus Stock Exchange that we have accepted a new project or we have commenced a new project today and it will take long a period of uh, uh, operation and we assume or we believe that it will create a larger value. They may not give the exact numbers. So when you say that information, you might see that your wealth is uh, increasing, but how much you don't know. The other thing is, since this company is talking about IPO, they are going for IPO. It's a private company. They are not in the listed market. So when you go for IPO, they are somewhere they are mentioned. They are going to use this project also a kind of a uh, pitch, sale pitch to tell the public or the investor that this is a huge project and we are going to create wealth. So please invest in this company. So in this case, you are issuing, issuing a prospectus to get the IPO money where you may mention the new project details reasonably. So when you have informed reasonably, people are aware. But if you are giving a limited information, information is not shared sufficiently, sufficiently, if it is not shared sufficiently, people may not uh, give the value creation by the 4 billion immediately. I am just giving you situation where uh, not necessarily, not necessarily 4 billion value is created, value is created to present, to present wealth. 4 billion is not immediately created to the wealth of the company. If I say wealth is 15 billion before the project, immediately after announcement, it does not come to 19 billion. Why? One reason, information not shared sufficiently. If the people do not know exactly total value creation of this project, then there is no way that it get created. Second, the background, background of this company management, background of this company management. If the management in the past had been very successful in all the projects that they have done, right, they have been very successful in the projects that they have done and people are aware of it, then there is definitely value creation. But if the background of the company management is not so, is not very successful, very successful, then you do not see that entire value getting created immediately. People may not have 100% confidence of the management whether this company can create the wealth into this magnitude. So they may not be very much confident. So that time it will not get created by the 4 billion itself. Third, Third important thing very relevant to this question is the riskiness. Riskiness of this project. We have been talking about 7 billion, sorry 7 years, 7 years of this project, no cash flows. 7 years, no cash flows, no cash flows, in the sense cash inflows, no cash inflows of this project. Until 7 years you are going to create, you are going to only do a research kind of thing or developing or testing process. You are not creating or you are not generating cash flows, cash inflows. In that case, the riskiness is looked at by investor. So the investor also may think, okay, it's true that it's a very good project, very needed project, all that is fine. But up to a reasonable time period, uh, we don't see that value created by this company immediately, not necessarily. That's why I said not necessarily when you say the riskiness is too high in this company or this project. So I as a shareholder or investor might not give value for this 4 billion immediately. I will wait for some time and after that goes into a reasonable level, then I realize okay this project will come to a uh, realization. I think last class I mentioned that 
this about this vaccine for this COVID-19 and other influenza. But as you know, like within a year, the vaccine had been developed. And we all in Sri Lanka, we have started using and every other part of the world also started using. So we think that similar, if this same question is reality, somebody has done it. He has started this project and he is expecting seven years and it takes seven years. Assume that seven years you takes to manufacture this. What happens? You don't have market. By the time some other competitors, all the market players have got, captured the market and that's already there in the market. So your company, your research seven years may not be worthwhile. So it's maybe a, not a good successful project. So what I'm trying to say is the riskiness is too high. So you may not be at the beginning giving the value of 4 billion to the wealth of your company. You cannot create wealth immediately. That is the third one. Fourth, you may have to uh, invest, uh, you may not, you may not, uh, what I would say, like uh, believe, right? It, one is riskiness and the other one is that you don't believe in value creation in that magnitude. Believe is not, you are not believing that value will be created by this project. So, so again, it's something to do riskiness and uh, other information in the market. You are not very much sure, so you wait for that. So you don't create wealth immediately. So these are the, some of the reasons why your wealth may not be created immediately to the wealth. But if, if these are not working, if they are not in the market condition, you will see theoretical 4 billion should get added. But personally, if I am saying I am the investor, I would say I don't think that 4 billion value created immediately. I may not give that value to the company immediately because there is a huge riskiness of this project. Huge riskiness. More than a background, assume that this company has been successful, long, long history company, very ethical people are involved in the company. So I will say, okay, background is very good. I'm not doubting that. And information sharing, if I am saying I'm going for IPO, I'm going to issue a prospectus to get the money into the market, money into the company, then the information is shared also. So there is no doubt on these two. The doubt will, will be on the riskiness and the believing. So riskiness is too high. So I don't think that 4 billion, immediately you can create wealth. Maybe some money, some amount of money you can say, okay, 1 billion or 500 million. You believe that value will be created, but not 4 billion. So be aware of that impact to the value creation of any NPV of a new project. You need to think all these things, okay? Then going into numbers, numbers, actually it's about a, a question where they have given you uh, various outcomes and additions. So I'm sure like you would have learned decision trees, decision trees in the, in the chartered syllabus, right? So maybe it's not very commonly tested in financial management, right? So I don't think the, even the, uh, syllabus, it's the study pack doesn't have a study pack, also doesn't have decision tree, right? Even the probabilities and explain uncertainty are discussed, it's not there. So I don't say that just because it's not there, you can't be tested because in chartered even till the final level, all the learning what we have in the previous stages can be tested. So we have to be aware of that, right? So keeping that uh, remark, going back to the Suggested answer because I'm not going to take in time. I better explain you stuff rather than doing calculations. When you go to the suggested answer, you will see as per the question, the pre-seen or unseen, you are talking about one is the testing to be done or not to be done. So you can see a decision node where you will have to see that one is whether you are testing or abandon. So you have a choice in between either to abandon the uh, project or test the project. So that will take, then you have the outcomes, right? You can see that outcome also there are two outcomes. One is a failure, other one is success. So they are talking about 70% day success. So obviously 30% day is a failure. Then the success also, two outcomes, two outcomes, then you have type 1 and type 2. Type 1 
type 2, two outcomes. That is 60 percent age, 60 percent age and 40 percent age. Type 1, 60 percent, type 2, 40 percent. The type 1, you are going to succeed, you are going to succeed there and you can look at the suggested answer. I am just trying to draw this to understand for understanding purposes. Then you will see that finally, if it is succeed, you develop or abandon. Develop or abandon. That is a decision making there. You have to make a decision whether to do it or not. Type 2 again, you have success and failure. Thus, if it is success, you have again decision making, develop or abandon. Develop or abandon. So, these are the uh, notes. Just to say what are decision making levels, there are two decision making, one is at the beginning whether test or abandon, after that you are going to make a decision here to develop or not develop. These are the outcomes reflecting with the probabilities we have mentioned, so it is in the suggested answer also. So, we need to find out, find out as you know that whenever you are given a probability, whenever you are given a probability say cash flow, cash flow say for year 1, you have 10 million cash flow. 30 percent probability and 15 million and you have 70 percent probability. So, what is the average? Average of this, average of this is 10 million into 30 percent, 15 million into 70 percent. So, that is your expected value, expected value cash flow. So, this is basically the probability whenever involved in any question, you have to multiply the cash flow with the probability and then add it together that will give you the expected value or the average cash flow for the year 1, average cash flow for year 1. So, that basically you will have to calculate for any probability related question. So, here it is about a decision making under decision tree. So, you have been given various uh, decision making and outcomes. So, if you take one by one, if you come on this first line, until the A or the develop, it will be A, right. You can see in the suggested answer. So, the second until the abandonment, abandonment here it is B, then C, D, E, F and G. So, these are the points. So, we need to calculate the present value or the NPV for these points. So, if you take the suggested answer, you are given the node A, right, node A where you will have the entire cash flow that is starting from here if you go in this line. So, you will say node A, you will have the 1.2 million initial investment for first phase and the year one end you will be in the investing 2.5 billion for second phase and 7.5 billion for third phase. Then you will have the cash flows cash flows from year seven, 7 to infinite period, not infinite period, 15 years, 15 years cash flows, that cash flows uh, present value, present value which is calculated, if you go back to your suggested answer previous page, previous page you take so, that you will see the previous page, you are given the revenue, revenue that is for 15 years, 15 years, if it is type 1, type 1, 10 billion per annum, 10 billion per annum you will have net, net annual cash flow after tax, that is your actually the operational commercial production cash flow that is from uh, fifth, seventh year in for 15 years 10 billion each year for type 1 if you are manufacturing. Type 2 you are manufacturing it is 3.1 billion for 15 years. So, that is basically in the suggested and you can see that type 1 10 billion type 2 3.1 billion and the annuity factor for the 15 years, annuity for factor for 15 years is 7.6, 7.6. So, what you would realize in your node A, 
61 billion, how it was calculated, is your 15 years cash flows, that is 10 billion, into 7.1, that will give you 71, it is 7 point, 7 point 6, 7.6, 7.6 into 10 billion, it will be 10 billion into 7.6, it's 76 billion, and 15 billion, you have to invest, you have to invest one off cash flow for the end of seven year, end of seven year. So you are going to get 61 billion, 61 billion, this is your present value, present value at the end of seventh year, at the end of seventh year. So that is what is suggested on the shows, at the end of seventh year, 61 billion. So when you take that node A, node A, you will see that year 0, year 1, 2, year 1, year 3 and year 7, you have this present value or the cash flow. That again discount at the rate of 10 percentage, then you get 22 billion NPV. Similarly, node A, B, node B, node C, you can see that relevant cash flows, NPV calculation. Node D, that is a type 2, type 2 you are manufacturing, so that is again, first three cash flows are, you are very much sure. Last one, year 7, there you will have 3.1 billion into 7.6, that is your annuity factor. 3.1 billion into 7.6 minus your 12.5 billion, 12.5 billion. So basically you will have 11.2 billion, 11.2 billion at end of 7 year, your present value of the future cash flow. So future cash flow's present value 11.2 billion at the end of 7 year, there is no D I am talking about, no D. Then your NPV 2.4 billion minus. So that basically gives you D NPV. In no D, no F, no G, you can see what are relevant cash flows that has been taken, as I mentioned here, each one. So relevant cash flow up to that point, present value are calculated. Then these are all NPVs. Then again go back to your suggested on the previous page. What you do, you will have to take the decision making here, decision making on the second part after you doing all research and everything, then you come to a final point where to develop or not develop for the type 1, type 1. They are A and B, your node A and B gives you 22 billion or 9.1 billion. So definitely if you abandon you are losing 9.1 billion. If you develop, you get 22.1 billion positive NPV. So you definitely select a 22.1 billion positive NPV project. So you develop. Then that is 75 percent chance only you have. Then 25 percent age is a failure. So 25 percent age failure is C, which is 9.1 billion failure. So 9.1 billion, 25 percent, 22 billion, 75 percent. So of that, like as I mentioned to you, in probability you multiply the relevant values to get the expected value. So 22.1 billion into 75 percent and you have 9.2 billion almost, 9.2 billion minus 25 percent. So that will give you the 14.3 billion, 14.3 billion for type 1, 14.3 billion. So if you multiply this. 22.1 billion into 0.75, that is 16.5 billion minus 9.2 billion into 2.5, that is 2.3 billion. Then you are according to 14.2 billion, that is your value. So it is 40.3 rounding off. So 14.3 billion is your type 1 if you manufacture, right, you get present value. Same thing you for type 2, again, you are going to compare if you are developing D, 2.4 billion you are losing, E, 8.2 billion you are losing. So definitely you will take the lower losing amount, that is 2.4 billion. So if you say 2.4 billion is your developing the type 2 uh, vaccine, 40 percent success rate, 60 percent failure rate, 60 percent age failure is the E, that is 8.2 billion. So when you multiply again like this, you will get 
5.9 billion type 2 in PV. So now you see you have 14.3 billion and 5.9 billion, 60 and 40 percent. Then you get uh, 6.2 billion, which is the again multiplied by the probability with the respect to NPVs, 6.2 billion. That you compare with the failure, that will be F 8.2 billion. So since you have failure will give you 8.2 billion if negative NPV, 6.2 is a selected one. So in that case, your outcome 6.2 against the 8.2. Then 6.2, you will have 70% chance, 30% percent chance you have a 8.2 billion loss. So on that, when you multiply, you get 4 billion roughly is your in PV when you test and run the whole thing. Abandon, if you abandon, you are losing 1.2 by billion, 1.25 billion. So definitely by testing, you are creating 4 billion wealth. By testing and carrying out the entire process, you are having NPV of 4 billion. Against 1.2 billion, you abandon the project at the beginning. After you invest, you realize that it's not going to work out. So you stop the project, it's 1.2 billion loss. But at the same time, if you do the testing and you go through this whole process, you are expected to, expected to create wealth of 4 billion. That's basically the answer. So the number what we have got or what has been given in the question 4 billion is almost the same in our calculation. So we are validating this number whether it's right or wrong. The number is correct. So basically the project is supposed to create wealth of 4 billion according to the expectation, according to the expectation. So please make sure that you are aware of the decision trees, right, aware of the decision trees. And you need to calculate the uh, values, present values anyway. But you have to calculate the expected value by multiplying the probability by the respective uh, present value or the cash flow. It's here, it's about not the cash flow, it's about the uh, present value. So whenever you are given a pro two present values and two probabilities, then you are talking about 10 million, say 10 billion uh, positive NPV, another 8 billion positive NPV. This has a 60% chance, this has a 40% chance. So when you multiply respective ones and you get the expected value, that's the average present value you are going to create. So basically 4 billion is the value creation. As the question asks, validate the accuracy, we have validated and comment whether there is increase, that was we have answered earlier. Now we move on to D part. D part, they are asking you conduct uh, analysis, financial analysis of conduct a financial statement analysis for the problematic SBUs. I think when we discussed a pre scene, there are five sectors. Five sectors we talked about. One is healthcare, healthcare, then consumer, consumer, uh, sorry, FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. Third, uh, power, that is wind power plant. Fourth, uh, leisure. Fifth, logistics. So these are the five sectors or the SBUs the company had been working on. And healthcare and FMCG is really performing well, really performing well. We have gone through that numbers early on the pre-scene. So they are performing, actually they are the ones who are creating wealth or they are making profits and their turnovers are very good and they are growing fast and we have only one concern there whether this company is doing over trading on these two segments. So that is something uh, if the examiner is interested in the unseen for your paper, they can ask about it because same precinct we are talking about. These two sectors, even though they are doing very good sales, very good profits, still need to think whether they are doing a over trading. Because I think there are certain symptoms we have looked at earlier. The liquidity issue is there. So that shows that sometimes they are over, over trading. They are not matching the uh, assets to the liability. In other words, they are uh, trading faster without having sufficient long term capital. So on that basis, these two, other than that aspect, they are very much uh, performing well. So we don't have any concern here. But these three sectors, 
these three sectors other than leisure where leisure had done uh, profits for the 2020 what we are talking but 2019 until that point they were making losses so 2020 they made profits they made profit but otherwise they are loss making these two segments always loss always loss so what we want to know out of these five sectors which are not performing so what they are trying to say conduct a financial statement analysis for the problematic SBU so what are problematic SBUs obviously these three these three may be leisure one year only loss uh, one year only profits but still they are also not uh, expected level of profitability so therefore we can say that these three are problematic comment on whether each of them is a going concern comment on whether they, each of them is going concern you are required to focus on any three key financial ratios of your choice together with qualitative factor including present microeconomic condition ex exclude the FMCG and LK SBU so obviously these two are excluded but the examiner also very much clear please exclude these two so these are bonus marks because it's the last part most of the time we don't have time to look at the last part so we lose marks so what I am trying to say anybody when you read that 15 marks 15 minutes 15 minutes are given to read the question paper so at the reading point of view you need to identify which question you are going to attempt and which question you will definitely score marks you are confident your confident level when you read it okay I am sure I will get these marks I am going to get maximum marks on this part so wherever you feel that you have to start with that right you don't need to say okay I have to start from uh, question number one or question number three no no you don't like that but generally case study 50 mark question very large very large question why I am saying is like you have to look at the pre seen side of it unseen and then you have to attempt many things so therefore the first ten, question one and two are generally easier comparatively so you can score marks so you better start on that and make sure that one and a half hours time you stop one and a half hours time you stop the question one and two by that time you should have done it right so that you are scored the marks then the balance one and a half year your fresh one and a half hours you should give for your pre scene if you can give more it's ideal because generally the first two questions you can score marks at the same time you again spend lower time so you have enough time to do the uh, question three so ideally you should have one and a half hours or more than that for the question three that is pre-seen or case study question when you're going to do that out of that again here the four parts are there these four parts you will feel quite comfortable with the ones where you are very knowledgeable you are very confident you are you get boosted up when you see that so that kind of thing you have to start first so that you get scoring then you move into a difficult one so you have to first get the marks so if I say like even a D part if I if anybody reads it first for, for A B C D D part it's a very independent question it's not depending on A or B or C it's a separate question so when you read it conduct a finance statement analysis for the problematic SBO where the pre-seen level itself you know what are the problematic these are the problematic and they say that comment on whether each of them is going concern okay we can do that calculate three ratios for each one key three financial of your choice together with qualitative factor so very very easy marks eight marks so you can start with this question and get the marks then move into the ones other ones right so that's up to you what I'm trying to tell you is note that each of the parts have its own plus and minus and you are individually for you you have to select which is easier for you right so then you start from there and scoring marks then your confidence level boosts then you can get into the difficult ones unless you go and try the low wrong one at the beginning then you are stuck and your confidence level comes down and even if you have a D part very easy eight marks you might be thinking no no I don't have time so I may miss it so you miss it also so better you take the ones which are easier for you to start with so going on that as you know we have discussed on the problematic SPUs at the pre scene also so you have the pre scene material pre scene ones so on the pre scene you have been told a segment segment analysis so you can look at the segment analysis five segment and we are talking here three segments right leisure travel logistics and power so under suggested answer because it's actually the ratio even though they ask sometimes you will realize that ratios have their limitation 
if you learn your theory properly, ratios have limitation. What are ratio limitation? If you say that your ratios are not comparable, not comparable in the sense that you don't have industry information, right? Or even if it's a loss making, loss making, the ratios may not give you uh, meaningful comparison. It's a loss making. So the numbers will say minus, minus, minus. So it doesn't give you any sensible, sensible comparison. So that limitation you should be aware of when you are looking at ratio. Otherwise, you just number calculation, you can do the number calculation. So we go to the suggested answer. You can see that they have taken net profit ratio, net profit ratio for the three segments, right? So I'm just explaining that you can just get the numbers from the pre scene and put into the calculation and you see the leisure and travel net profit ratio that is divided net profit before tax divided by sales. 2022 percent to the 19.5%. So basically when you look at it itself, you say that net profit is very low, very low. But at least 2019 to 20, leisure sector has better performed, better performed. To logistics, it's 1% net profit ratio last year, 0.5 minus, both are minus. So they are not performing well. Power and energy, so again 0.13, uh, sorry, 1.3 and 1% 2020 negative, again not performing. So that ratio has indicated that two segments are very bad, at least leisure and travel has continued or the perform 2020, but still it's very small uh, profit margin. Return on assets, these numbers are increasing. So suggested answer I'm straight away taking without me doing calculation, because suggested answer has taken the numbers from the pre scene. So net income, leisure and sector, leisure sector, 75 million divided by total asset 2.1 billion. So we are talking about 3% return on assets, 1% minus. Other all the segments or the other two segments, two, two years, all minus, return on assets are minus. So that's why I said, when you say you are loss making, your ratios, what it's going to tell you? It will say minus number. But if you have a positive number, at least with the two years, and maybe with your industry information, then you have meaningful comparison. Otherwise, ratio doesn't give you meaningful comparison. So here, the examiner wants just you to calculate numbers and get some marks. So you are going to get this, right? We'll come to the discussion later, right? I'm just showing the number related stuff. Then they have taken total assets and liability comparison and interest coverage ratio. So what do you need to know? When you looked at these three segments, Logistics and power and energy is loss making. And that even at the PNL itself we can tell that. But the ratio also shows that same understanding. Only ratio had profit earned on the last year. Now when you look at the present context, we are in 2020, March, we are talking about March year end, and the COVID just started. COVID just started. And we know the subsequent part what happened. We are almost one year later than that. So we know what was going through or what was uh, experience this industry would have gone through. Leisure sector, even though 2020 March they have made profit, but subsequent to that, it's a very bad scenario. So they are making losses. They cannot make profits. They will not be making money. So the last one, you know, hotel sectors are performing well. So we have to understand that leisure sector, even though made profit, that means it's a loss making. So it may be a temporary, this may be a temporary situation, but still the leisure sector is badly affected. Logistics and power and energy, they are, even before COVID, they are making losses, right? They are making losses. So the question is, what was the reason? So we don't have much information to analyze the case of those two sectors, but power and energy is a windmill. As you know that windmill in Sri Lanka, renewable energy is promoted like nothing in this uh, present situation. The government has been pushing much as possible to uh, bring uh, or create or power generate from the wind, solar and the hydro. So therefore, there are a lot of opportunities available, but still the wind power had been making losses a couple of years, five megawatts, it's quite a large number. Why they are making losses? So we need to know that, we need to analyze that. So the question doesn't have much information, but if you are really finding out the losses are mainly due to the tariff, tariff, I think even when we discussed the pre-scene, I talked about it. If the tariff what we have got is very low. We also have to tender and get this. When you got that tender, we have bid it for the price and the price what we offered is a 12 rupees or something and we have got a project. 
that wealth is not sufficient to make you money you can't create wealth so if that is the case then you are in a bad situation you cannot run this project because the tariff will be there and you are not going to make money unless you have got a tariff rates or the ta tariff agreement where your tariff will be changed based on the market condition in the future so if there is a possibility like that your flexibility is there then you may think of this continuing but otherwise if you realize that it's because of tariff you have gone into wrong project then you have to decide what to do next but if you see there are opportunities because of this you are going to get more and more projects and which will create wealth maybe you will have this project and create wealth from the other projects so that is one angle but going concern point of view a uh, large amount of question comes why this company had been losses so if that has to be properly identified and if it is uh, tariff related or something we have invested heavily uh, uh, inefficiently we have invested then we cannot create wealth or we cannot become npv positive then this is not a going concern second coming to logistic sector logistic sector it's dependent on import export businesses 2020 uh imports have come down but exports also come down but the exports are still happening uh compared to imports exports are better but that is because of restriction placed by the government so logistics sector will also start uh coming back to the normalcy after the maybe a couple of months or couple of years we don't know we don't know which it cannot be predicted by anybody so assuming the things will be positive if the things are positive the logistics sector could be turning around could be could be turned around over the future period so we need to make a judgment call by the management after analysis whether logistics sector is it loss making because of the i have fixed overheads our operating leverage is very high or is it something else if it operating is very high then we are in a difficult situation because until the reasonable volume comes to your business you are going to make losses so whether it's needed or not you have to decide third it's about the leisure sector leisure sector temporarily it has a setback because of covid 19 but after a year after a year assuming that vaccination all over the world stops this virus and there is a positive side of it and everyone starts back to normal then the total industry can come back there will be boom anyway but that we have to wait for some time so until that time and then company is planning of a Uh, another two five star hotels right we have been talking at the pre seen level so whether that two projects needs to be continued to be done or we have to stop it that question needs to be asked because if the tourism sector present scenario negative scenario going to continue for a couple of years then we need to decide whether that project is going to be uh, started or completed according to plan or we need to postpone it we need to postpone it or we have to stop it at that point and do something else so this kind of thinking has to go through it's not one word answer say yes going concern is not there for leisure sector no one can say that because in sri lanka we have a large amount of contribution from leisure sector which had there are a lot of people working in the industry so and we as a, a country a blessed with me nature to provide that tourism uh, what you call a business to the other people so definitely there is an opportunity for us to make money also from that sector so it's not a, a short term thing or it's not something you can decide okay today we close it down and we start again it's not possible so you have to go through the bad patch for a period and come back so i would say tourism sector you have a possibility of uh, turning around after tourism start booming so you have to say that conditional thing leisure so logistics and power energy after proper analysis you have to decide whether to continue or wind up that two businesses the all disposed that businesses you know point you continue with that if it that it has a inherent problems inherent problem we are i mentioned when you have invested heavily or your tariffs are very low Log logistics your fixed overheads are very high that is operating very very high then you need to decide how to sort that problem if you can't sort that problem you better stop that business so these are the analysis point of view but i would like to make a comment of this sector so again coming back to the pre seen level pre seen level what we need to understand this 2020 december you have gone through we have gone through the paper the examiner had been testing on to more i would say into the study pack aspects right there are question on uh, covariance that kind of information so those are in study pack 
and even the valuation question was not difficult, right? If you looked at, it was a basic Kerning per share, dividend per share calculation. Then we had the free cash flow based valuation. We did it for the case study, very straightforward. And the first question was basically simple NPV calculation, even though there were a lot of numbers involved, but it is a straightforward question. So if you talk about the paper, we had, we had areas tested already, same precinct we are going to use for the, your paper. So your question one is about NPV, question two, it's about uh, what you call portfolio management. Portfolio management with the standard deviation, mean, all that stuff. And then valuation. Question three, it's about your valuation chapter, free cash flow. Free cash flow the firm. Then we had the debt financing or the capital structure capital structure area. Then we have financial statement analysis. That's the last part we discussed. Then again your NPV using the decision tree, decision tree area. So these are key areas which were tested, which were tested in this part. I think in the process and the valuation, even WACC was tested, WACC was tested. Financial analysis, analysis ratios were the key and your macro understanding, macro understanding. So if you take, these are the areas being tested in your paper, 2020 December. NPV, again NPV, okay. Portfolio management, valuation, and uh, what you call the dividend cash flow basis, I think the, yeah, B part was dividend cash flow basis, 10 marks was there for that. So this is a dividend based, dividend cash flows. This valuation is about free cash flows, free cash flows firm. Here debt capital structure, they were talking about how the capital structure has to be done or how, they, how there is an impact because seven year period, no revenue generated, only you have to pay the debt, how it's going to impact your present business, what is the purpose of you creating a new company, all were discussed in this part. Financial analysis is basically a ratio understanding and the macro picture, present environment situation, how the business have to be looked at. So these are the areas being tested. So it's not very many areas comparatively, okay. So you have a lot of other areas not tested in this whole thing. One, your foreign currency management, foreign currency management. As you know, the company has invested 35% in Bangladesh operations. Since it has been invested in Bangladesh over 35%, there can be possibility in the unseen, in our paper, they can talk about uh, going to a merging or the acquiring balance percentage in that company. So you could be asked to value the Bangladesh operation from the Bangladesh cash flows. So there will be foreign currency, definitely foreign currency cash flows involved. So there will be exchange rate involvement. So you could be asked to uh, what you call value that company with the uh, NPV, as uh, not the NPV, the exchange rate impacted cash flows. You can be asked on the foreign currency management and the valuation on the valuation for the Bangladesh operation. That is one area could be possible since there is no foreign currency management tested in this area. Second, as I mentioned, here we have talked about the non-performing sectors. Non-performing sectors, they can again talk about non-performing sector non-performing sectors they can tell you to restructuring, restructuring those businesses, right? So they can ask the strategies for restructuring, right? What are strategies? So as you know, the loss making ones, always do you look for operating leverage, operating leverage. In other words, how much you are dependent on fixed overhead, how much fixed overheads. 
So operating leverage or how much fixed overhead businesses. So you need to see how to convert the fixed overhead businesses into variable fixed or variable overheads businesses. So that you are not going to incur high fixed overheads to run your business. So that is something you need to look at in your restructuring. Then uh, performing sector. I'm coming to performing sectors. Performing sectors, FMCG, we are talking about FMCG and healthcare. These two sectors, as I mentioned, under working capital area, over trading. You can be asked whether that company is going through over trading situation. So maybe what we discussed under pre and analysis or discussion, you can give some certain uh, uh, ratios to show that this company liquidity concerns are there and they have funded their growth through the current liabilities or short term finan financing. So there is over trading symptoms. So we have to sort out that. But this company it's not very difficult because they are only 14% gearing company. 14% gearing. 14% gearing is very low. So always remember that any company which is performing well, which is performing well and with a low gearing, low gearing. If it is a 14 percent gearing, very low gearing and you are doing well, you are doing well. In that case, other than three sectors, uh, two sectors are doing well. So you have always possibility of further borrowing, further borrowing. Why? You can borrow money at a lower cost, borrow money at a lower cost. So definitely you can borrow money at lower cost and you can invest and make money. So the gearing objective is to make money for shareholder or wealth creation. So you try much as possible to borrow money. So what I could say is these two sectors, even though if you see there's over trading situation, you don't have to worry much, you can borrow money and invest. But as we know, they mentioned for that mega project, we may not, you don't have the same mega project for your paper, so don't worry about it. In your one, if they are saying they are going for IPO, you are going for IPO, you need to have a reason for going for IPO. That is my point. What is the reason are you going for IPO? Because you are a profitable company. You are a profitable company and you are able to borrow further money because you are at a 14 percent gearing. You can say that, okay, I am going for like a project like mega project where you have to uh, invest in long, larger projects, say 15, 20 billion, then I want money from the public. The existing 10 shareholders cannot contribute. In that case, yeah, you can go for public issue. The other thing you may say, okay, no, I want to establish a market value for my company. There are shareholders who want to exit from the business. They want to know the real value and exit. So in that case, yes, you can go for IPO. But otherwise, if you are really raising money, simply you are raising money, you are raising at a higher cost. Why? You definitely cost of equity is more than cost of debt after tax. So all of us know this, this relationship. And when you are saying your gearing is 14% only, you have to rethink of raising further shareholder money, further shareholder money. If at all you should get more debt money, a small portion of shareholder money. You can go for IPO, no problem, but raise small money rather than going for a large amount of money. Unless you have a very large plan, say maybe the Bangladesh operation we are talking, you want to invest in Bangladesh, you have invested 980 million, almost 1 billion, 35% ownership. Now that uh, even say another 60 odd percentage, you are talking another 2 billion. So it's not big money. 2 billion money you can raise from a bank because your company performing and your borrowing cost is cheaper. Your gearing is lower. So you are able, you are 12, 12 point some billion net, asset, net uh, shareholder funds company. So 2 to 3 billion funding is not a big issue. So you can easily borrow money and invest in any project. Even in, in Bangladesh you can invest. All you can think of. Only thing, since the Bangladesh investment you are making in Bangladesh currency, right? I think it's Bangladesh currency or US dollar. Just look at it. So they are given equivalent value of 5.5 million dollars, but in Taka, Bangladesh currency only they mention. So if you are going to invest in Bangladesh currency, please remember that uh, the investment, one of the risk management, one of the risk management technique you might think, especially when you say foreign investment, to borrow in that respective currency. So you are saying you are investing some X amount of, I think they are mentioning about 450 million Taka you have invested already. 
So, you are borrowing or you are using your money to invest there. So, if you are going to have a depreciation of your Taka currency or Sri Lanka rupee against Taka currency, then you are losing, right. So, in this case, it is a not a import, it is a kind of investment you are done. So, if Taka currency depreciates, Sri Lanka rupee depreciating, you are benefiting. Taka currency is depreciating, then you are going to lose money. If Sri Lanka is depreciating, you are not having problem because your asset value will increase in rupee term. Your asset value will increase in rupee term, so you are going to gain. But if the Taka currency is going to depreciate against Sri Lanka rupees, then you are in trouble. So, what do you do? You borrow money in Taka currency and invest in that country. So, one of the exchange rate risk management you might think in case you have unseen material say that you are going to invest, you can think on that line to borrow money in Taka currency. If you have invested in Taka currency, you borrow money in that currency. If you are going to invest in dollars, better borrow in dollars and invest. So, please note, so those are the few things you can go or continue on the unseen material. Then in addition, as a valuation question anyway and the case study question, please note the valuation is must. Whatever the paper, your case study will have valuation, again it will have free cash flows to firm. So, as you know the free cash flows firm, we discount using WACZ and value of equity plus debt. From that you minus value of equity, value of debt, then you get value of equity. So, this format most of the cases will have that. So, definitely your paper cannot be ex exception. So, the more possibility that this is a free cash flows ways of calculating, we know WACC we have done it, right? we know the WAC amount, you discount and get a value of equity plus debt. From that debt you minus the balance sheet debt, you do not have a market value of debt, then you get value of equity. So, this valuation chapter question can be asked. I think there is another area of PE because there are two companies in the pre scene, they are given you PE. Actually, they are given you market value in the pre seen material. If you go to the pre seen material, pre seen material, page 10, pre seen material, page 10, you will see that. Page number 10, pre seen, you will see that. You have been given two compar compar competitor companies, it is a listed companies, they have given you market value, market value means market price per share and the earning per share. As you know the earning per share and market price you can see the PE ratio, same way you can calculate other company also, even your company you can calculate. So, that is just to understand that your PE based valuation also can be asked, PE based valuation can be asked. So, we have already know the net asset based valuation because balance sheet 12 point billion is your net assets also. So, these are valuation area, dividend cash flows very rarely, right. So, you can be asked, but PE and net assets free cash flows are areas can be tested. So, as I mentioned one foreign currency management possibility, then non-performing sector strategies or restructuring plans, third for performing sector what kind of issues, it could be over trading. Fourth, valuation chapter where you can be asked on free cash flow, PE and net assets. Fifth, risk management, they have not talked about it. Foreign currency is a separate risk management, foreign currency management, but you could be asked on risk management on overall businesses, overall business. So, your paper, right, your paper what other areas could be asked. So, one of the thing what I mentioned, your risk management. So, you need to know what are risk management. All the businesses, there are five sectors we are talking here, all businesses went through this COVID-19. Apart from all the business risk, the industries or businesses gone through, these are separate risk altogether every business has to face, okay. So, you need to see what, what was the uh, industry or what was the business which was getting affected very much. As you know the tourism sector we talked about definitely they have got lost 
lost me they are uh, losing money right lot of hotels and restaurants and tourism related business travel right even the taxis right whoever basically dependent on even a tour operators tour uh, buses all that businesses are affected and if you take the southern or even northern any area where the tourism was targeted that small small business got affected so all of us know that tourism sector got affected severely compared to other industries right normally the food and beverages and pharmaceutical even the service like uh, insurance banking uh, even the travel what you call the education services all are making money right you can't say that they were losing money because there was a online platform a lot of things were happening even banks and insurance company all were doing good so they were not okay there are impacts not that they don't have impacts so they have managed that issues well that is what risk management is so they were able to manage the risk better and they were adapting to the situation faster they changed themselves they got out of the problems so they were able to make money certain ones you cannot change much you have to live with it the for example if you say hotel industry if you say you you don't get tourism then you have a difficulty especially the main hotels but if you take restaurants at least you can deliver is you are doing people even though people can't have the you know get togethers and parties but still you can deliver food and th- stuff so you are able to get some money so you are the shopping complexes where most of the showrooms for textiles and uh, accessories various products they were going through difficult times so what i'm trying to say all these businesses have risk various types of risk so you can think of before covid 90 you would have been thinking a lot of risk for each and every business but with all that risk this risk came as a new risk which disturbed totally a different level different framework of issues so the risk management had to play in so when you see the risk mostly the companies have overheads what i would like to say here the overheads the overheads you have two components fixed overheads variable overheads what we all the business went through and understood this fixed overheads if you have very high component high component you are going through very very difficult situation why if you say fixed overheads are say you have taken a uh, showroom where you have goods to sell and you have rented out the premises and people work there and electricity all that security all that is there now if you don't have customers coming in not the normal level okay i'm not talking about lockdown period alone even after that people don't turn to your shops very much so what happens your overheads are fixed you have very much i overheads you have 10 people in the showroom all 10 people have to pay salary at least some salary have to be paid 50% at least you have to pay electricity have to be incurred you can't switch off the lights and say people to come also you can't do that your rent whether you like it or not you pay rent how many showrooms how many outlets you have to pay rent if you are not having your own building this i o h when you don't have turnover eat into your profits eat into your profits in other way you make losses why the tourism sector is making losses no tourists no sales but you have the overheads fixed overheads if it is variable nature you are not having the problem what is variable nature you say online order you you manufacture you cook food and sell online you basically get orders and deliver when you get order you cook when you no order you don't cook you don't have a separate place and say this is hotel restaurant people come no spending on that you may be do it at your small area at home or small place you take it not a very high cost based on the order you manufacture so your variable overheads are very high fixed overheads are very small if that is the case even when you say recession recession like covid 19 also resulted in a recession in most of the countries this recession period you don't have problem if you say your variable overhead component is very high but if your fixed overhead component is very high sorry you are loss making you are loss making so any industry which have gone through difficult times and make not making money 
One is the sales drop. The other important thing, their fixed overheads are very high. So the company which have very less fixed overheads, or they have very high variable percentage, variable overhead component, they are able to survive and they can come up faster. So you need to think, if you are business have this kind of situation, you will change. I'm sure like a lot of companies started thinking on that line. They started thinking on this line to say, okay, we do not have, we should not have unnecessarily space that is building, renting out premises. And we should not have employees working in the organization at a very high fixed overheads. We need to see the best, we need to make it to the sales. We have to convert the staff salary to the link to the sales rather than having fixed overheads, fixed salary very much. Right, so there are a lot of things people start thinking. Online sales, you don't need space, you don't need a large showroom, large outlet. outlet. You don't have a thousand or, or fifteen thousand square feet, I just rent it out and see nobody's coming. And then fifteen thousand rent, you are paying. So I reduce the space, let off small area, but you can sell online. So this kind of shift has taken place over the past. It's not 100%, but there is a percentage of business that shifted to the online platform. So therefore, you need to understand you reduce your fixed overhead compound. That is very important on this risk management level in order to avoid your business becoming a bankrupt. Your business becoming bankrupt, you have to do that. Other thing is diversification. Under portfolio management, all of us has discussed this diversification. If you see recent past, John Key's profitability of the group, the leisure sector didn't perform, but the other sectors have performed. So you can see that they are advantage of diversifying, diversifying advantage. If you are a company or a group, if you are diversified into many businesses, one business, tourism sector doesn't do well, other sectors are doing well. Your financial services, your uh, transport or uh, port related services, or even your uh, what you call the uh, elephant house brands or even the Kiel supermarket have been making money. So you can see that leisure is not but other sectors doing. Why? You have diversified. So that is risk management, risk management. So you should not depend on one product or one services or one industry. You better get into many sectors so that your risk is diversified away. So your bad times or recession times, one sector may not work, work other sector may work. So you are performing, overall you are balanced off. Otherwise all the entire sector is failure, you are in trouble. Assume that you have only, only hotels, only five hotels you have. All five hotels are now closed or no business, what happened? You cannot survive and you have borrowed money. You have to pay the finance. Okay, there are moratorium given by banks and the government pushing. But how long? How long? Still you have to make your payments. You have to survive. So it's a very difficult question to answer. So diversification will reduce your impact of risk. So that is the second thing. One is the fixed overhead component you are reducing. Second, you are talking about diversifying your businesses. Diversifying your businesses. Third, you need to come up, you need to make decision faster, decision faster. Why I am saying this, sometimes you need to decide, you need to decide. I can remember when the COVID-19 started, there are certain travel businesses. Within a month, within a month, maybe, it, maybe too early sometimes, but within a month they decided that some of the staff people, they said that they are sending home. They say that, okay, the company is retrenching staff or they are paying off something and they are basically closing the business. So you have to decide. You have to decide. That's one example. So if everything, every business you will decide. You can't run at a loss for a few years and you can't destroy the wealth of the shareholder. So you have to decide thing. You have to maybe join with somebody else, join with somebody else. Or you have to come up with some plan of solving your company problem rather than waiting for situation to be one day later. Just wait. What happens? You lose money. You lose money. So you have got to decide. Okay, even now, sometimes the tourism sector, there are hotels, people might think, okay, I better, better sell it. I better sell it. Actually, I know that one group sold a hotel. For them, they see that it's difficult for them to create wealth. There's another company group bought the same hotel. Thinking what? 
after the COVID-19, they can make money out of it. So these are two ways of thinking. But definitely there is a person who looks at the uh, uh, issue as a challenge and come and think as a positive thing for him to long run. Then another person thinks, no, it's a negative situation. Better we get out of it. So in the end of the day, both are decision making. So your decision making is a risk management. Your decision making at the right time, right time itself a risk management. Right, you don't make any decision mean you are not making any effort to solve or come out of the risk. Okay, so that's about the decisions. Fourth, fourth, you need to see what are the tools available, what are the alternatives available for the problem what I'm faced with. So the you have to find the alternatives, alternatives immediately alternatives immediately you you don't think that okay i don't have any alternative there are definitely alternative for any problems so you have to come up with, come up with the problem solving alternatives and select one of them maybe right maybe wrong but you have to decide so that is part of risk management so i'm just giving you some idea so that this can be asked in different angle from this case so you better get ready with the uh, understanding of the case what we have talked about. Then as I know the exchange rate in Sri Lanka, exchange rate in Sri Lanka had under pressure, right? All of us know that one dollar went to 200 rupees, 205 rupees or 200 rupees, right? Now it's 195 levels or 197 levels. So it went to 205 rupees. So Sri Lanka rupee depreciated, depreciated significantly over the last year, over the last year. So we all have to financial management people, we should know that dollar had appreciated, rupee had depreciated. So that will uh, impact the entire business, entire business, entire country, unless you are exporter, unless you are exporter. So anybody who is importing goods will have to face this exchange rate impact. So all of us have to know that how the exchange rate in, will impact this health HCL, that company called HCL. So exchange rate will have an impact on all this. Healthcare, we are importing pharmaceutical products, so we have an impact on exchange rate. And logistics, again it based on the export import business, even though warehousing and logistics and transports, but still you have the, if some of the equipments you are going to manufacture or importing for the purpose, purpose of providing the services, you are going to, even it can be vehicle you are importing, it depends on the what you are importing, but all are going to face the exchange rate impact. Then the leisure, leisure as you know that tourism if it comes then you are generating dollars of foreign currency. Even if you generate some of the things if you are going to put up this 5 star hotel, 5 star hotel, this 5 star hotel, 2 5 star hotels are going to be constructed. For that some of the material definitely going to be imported. So the exchange rate have impact on those also. Your cost of your project, what you planned at the pre scene will go up, will go up because of exchange rate depreciation. So these are some of the things I'm trying to tell you, the impact on your business. Maybe the Bangladesh business you will benefit because you have invested outside and if Sri Lanka rupee depreciating against Bangladesh currency, you will benefit out of it. Power sector, it's a local based business, already you have invested, so therefore there is no further exchange rate impact on your business. Uh, only advantage you might think of is the Sri Lanka predominantly based on thermal power. Thermal power is oil imports, oil imports are dependent on exchange rate, so exchange rate depreciation means oil import cost goes up. So your cost of producing electricity under thermal power is expensive. So there is opportunity for other renewable energy sector where they can give you better rate. So if that is their opportunity, you may benefit out of the exchange rate for the term, what you call the wind power project. Other than that, your fast moving consumer goods, fast moving consumer goods, whatever we have talked about earlier, other than the ones which are manufactured in Sri Lanka, you are okay. But once whatever you are importing, you will definitely have an impact. And even hospital sector, healthcare, the equipments are imported, so exchange rate have impact on those businesses. So I'm trying to tell you that exchange rate, Sri Lanka at, at this moment still we are talking about it, how what's going to happen in the exchange rate in the future months. 
So therefore, the possibility is the exchange rate can be related to your case and there can be impact, very high impact on certain sectors. So you should be planning for if these are the impact, what are the risk minimization. As you know, there are various risk minimization techniques you would have learned under theory. Matching assets and liabilities. Uh, if you are an exporter, you can talk about invoicing in local currency. Your, uh, sorry, if you are an importer, you can talk about invoicing in local currency. Exporter, you don't need to local invoicing because you will benefit out of the foreign currency. Then you will have uh, matching receipts and payments. You can have dollar accounts and maintain that for the leisure sector at least. Then you are talking about, uh, say, Bangladesh investment, you can get your returns or dividends in the foreign currency. So that money can be used for any exchange rate you need to buy. Then other ma ma forward rate, forward exchange contracts in Sri Lanka, because of import restriction, forward exchange contracts are not given for a long time, long period. But uh, otherwise you are available with the forward exchange contract, so you should know about it, what's happening in the market, forward exchange contracts. Then uh, other aging techniques like option contracts, which are very not very much available in Sri Lankan context. So normal netting concepts will not come here because we are not a group, multinational group, so we don't have a netting concept. So what we can think of it is only the matching receipts and payments and matching assets and liabilities and forward exchange contract if it is available in the market. Then we are talking about uh, leads and legs where you can delay sometime payments and we can delay the uh, receipts of the money in foreign currency. So those are the things, exchange rate risk management techniques. So please be aware of those because definitely that area may not be tested, you have a chance. The other area I would like to say the capital structure. Capital structure, the examiner can be asking on this area simply because your gearing is very low. Gearing is low. So examiner can uh, put it to you saying, okay, why your uh, why you think that your financing of your new project or financing your requirements should be done with debt capital. So we have a very have a cl clear idea that always when the company profitable, please note this, profitable and low gearing. Profitable and low gearing. Then debt financing is the answer. Debt financing is the answer. You have to be profitable. What do you mean by profitable? Your uh, return on assets is more than cost of debt. Cost of debt, if, even if you say just cost of debt, return on assets is more than cost of debt. If your return is more than cost of debt, always borrow money and invest. Always borrow money and invest. Only thing you should look at the gearing. If it is low gearing, no question about it, just borrow and money, borrow and invest. So definitely, we are talking about environment, 2020 later part, you everybody know that 2020, even mid part onward, the interest rate started falling. It has fallen very much. So 2020, the interest rate at the low, lower levels, lower levels. So when you say low level of interest or lowest interest and you are profitable company, how you finance? Borrow money and invest. So your company needs to gear. What's the purpose of gearing? Objective of gearing is what? Objective of gearing is maximize, maximize shareholder returns. Please understand. Objective of gearing, objective of gearing is always maximize shareholder returns. So you can borrow money at 8% or 10% and invest and earn 15% and 5% goes to shareholder. So you create wealth for shareholder continuously. So this area, this question, have enough room for borrow money and invest. So any, any other option we are they talking about IPO, all that, you can say various other reasons you can go IPO, but to fund your business, ideally you should fund through debt money, not from equity money. By do taking debt money, you are able to create more wealth for shareholder. End of the day, you want to create wealth for shareholder, that's your primary objective. You can definitely do that by borrowing money. So please keep in mind MNM1, MNM2 capital structure area also you can go through to understand what it is because there is a huge opportunity for you to create wealth by borrowing money. So keep that in mind. So 
I think uh, with that you will have reasonable good knowledge on good knowledge on uh, the areas have been tested in this part 2020. With that you know that valuation area has been tested, so you have to master valuation. You know how to get the uh, value of the company and value of equity plus debt and you can compare with the competitor company because they have not talked about competitor company much in the unseen. Maybe your paper they can talk about it so you should be knowing how to compare these companies. Then uh, the areas whatever we have discussed are reasonably uh, the examiner could test for your paper. Make sure that you manage your time properly because three hour paper you need to balance with your three questions. One and a half hours needs to be given for your pre scene or the case study question. Another one and a half hours is for first question and one, two questions. So you need to make sure that your time is reasonably given rather than giving more, ma more time for one question and losing out on the others. Generally what happens is a very lengthy question, it will take a longer time. So you would also will be busy in doing that question, but you lose out the marks because you are going to lose out time. So please make sure that you are allocating your time accordingly and you should have a practice I'm sure you're final level students so you have done many times exams so you know what to do but still exam level your main maintenance of your time is important the other important thing is your confidence level confidence level so any part any point in your exam three hours don't lose your confidence make sure that you are able to do the entire paper properly have the self-confidence at high, high level so that you are motivated throughout the paper. Even if your difficult ones are asked in one part or two part, don't get disturbed. Just leave it because you are not trying to get 80, 90 marks. You are talking about 50 marks passing. So you can get 50 marks provided you are concentrating and getting bits and pieces of marks everywhere rather than leaving out one question totally. Uh, maybe if you don't know anything about one part, just leave it that you can't get anyway. Other than that, all the parts try much as possible. Don't waste time unnecessarily on putting to multiply. If you are rushing for time last time, 5, 10 minutes where you have to do another 10, 15 marks question, better spend the 10 and 50 marks question rather than finalizing the NPV calculation or final number discounting factor multiplication. Don't waste time there because you have 15 marks or 10 marks, another part, you can get easily 5, 6 marks. So that marks you can score. So please plan out yourselves very much. Right, rather than getting lost in the paper. Okay, so I'm sure this is after a year we are having a physical examination. So definitely you have an edge over earlier situation because you are like earlier previous times you are going to sit and do the exam. So please be uh, be safe and do your exam properly. All the very best. Thank you.